everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be here tonight, um, especially for someone like me who is a historian of early New York City to be a guest of the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Memorial Library. Um, as you can imagine, um, Chancellor Livingston is uh, one of my favorite um, patriots in the history of New York. And um, it truly is an honor to be with you here tonight. And um, give me a moment, I'm going to start my slideshow about Aaron and Theodosia Burr. So just give me a moment to uh, begin sharing this with you. And you should be seeing that now. And hold on just a moment because I have another screen that I want to be able to see myself. Here we go. Um, so thank you everyone for having me tonight. I know this is a bit of a different type of lecture uh, for you, but I hope you will still enjoy it quite a, a lot. Um, we're going to talk tonight about Theodosia Burr, the exceptional daughter of Vice President Aaron Burr. And for your reference, that is my full name, Karen Chero Quinones. And you can reach me at Karen at PatriotToursNYC.com, which is my website. And I'm also Patriot Tours NYC on Facebook and YouTube. Um, every Friday night at this time, if you're interested in watching, I do a lecture as my 18th century reenactment character, um, Mrs. Q. And you can see that on Facebook and um, on YouTube. So I hope maybe some of you will start to join me for some history lessons from the point of view of an 18th century lady. Um, so tonight our topic is the magnificent daughter of um, Aaron Burr, Theodosia Burr. As you know, um, Aaron was the third vice president of the United States of America. Now, when most people think about Aaron Burr, I know you think of two things, the duel with Alexander Hamilton in 1804, um, in which he did shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton. There is no doubt about that. Um, there is a bit of doubt over whether or not he intended to shoot and kill Hamilton in that duel. Um, people still debate that to this day, um, what his true intentions were. And you may or may not know that just a few years later in 1807, um, former Vice President Burr was tried for treason against the United States of America, and he was found not guilty in that trial. Um, unfortunately, this is the legacy we have today of Aaron Burr, and most people are not aware of many of the other things he achieved in his life. Um, his, his military and political careers have been largely forgotten. For instance, he was a decorated colonel in the Continental Army. He was a successful lawyer, a New York State Assemblyman twice, and um, one of the first attorney generals of the state of New York. He then became a United States Senator and vice president all by his early 40s. Um, during that time, he rose to being the leader of New York's Democratic Republicans, also known as anti-federalists by their federalist rivals. So most people are not aware of his very stellar um, political and legal career leading up to those two unfortunate events. Now, like all people, Aaron Burr, like many of us, right, has a public persona and he has a private persona as well. And tonight, although we're going to look a little bit at his political career, we're going to look more at the personal Aaron Burr. Who was he as a husband and a father? And that's something that is largely forgotten today um, when we study American history. Burr is a very unusual man for the 18th century. He's far ahead of his time. For instance, um, Aaron Burr believes women are equally capable intellectually as men. And he believes that all people, regardless of sex or race, should be educated to the maximum of their potential. He not only says all of this, but he leads by example by having his daughter as well educated as a firstborn son. He also was an abolitionist. He freed all of the Burr family slaves, made them servants, and also paid for them to attend day school. He also allowed them the use of his extensive and impressive home library. So Mr. Burr is not somebody who only speaks about these issues, but he lives these issues. Um, Burr set out to create a new type of American woman, a thinking, independent, capable and secure woman. And the two pictures you're looking at, by the way, are the portraits of Aaron and his daughter, Theodosia, as done by artist John Vanderlyn. Um, in these pictures, Aaron is in his early 40s, Theodosia is 18, and both were commissioned by Aaron Burr. 
Now, in order to understand what made Aaron Burr such an unusual man for his time, let's take a look at who Aaron Burr was, because he, he, I'm sure you all know that a lot of who we are today is dependent upon how we started out in life. And Aaron has an interesting um, life. Um, he was born in 1756 to the Reverend Aaron Burr Sr. and Esther Edwards Burr. His father attended Yale and was accepted at only 13 years old after studying for college with Jonathan Edwards. And many of you may remember that Jonathan Edwards was one of the most influential philosophical and theological thinkers of the 18th century. He's a Presbyterian pastor and writer, and he's mostly known for his involvement in what we call the First Great Awakening, which was a Christian revival that spread throughout the American colonies in the early 1800s. His daughter, Esther Edwards, um, married his student, um, Reverend Aaron Burr. Together, they moved to a town near Princeton, New Jersey, where Mr. Burr, or I should say Reverend Burr, started a college, which he called the College of New Jersey. Some of you might know today that is Princeton. So Aaron Burr's father is the founder of Princeton College. And of course, his grandfather was Jonathan Edwards. So Burr really is the beneficiary of a very impressive intellectual lineage. He isn't he isn't um, money aristocracy. Burr comes from intellectual aristocracy and a lot was expected of him. He and his older sister, Sarah, um, were orphaned when their parents died when Burr was around two years old. So for you Hamilton fans, Hamilton was an orphan, Burr was an orphan. Both men are extremely intelligent, driven, ambitious men. They share a lot of early personal characteristics. So he and his older sister, Sarah, were eventually raised by another Edwards, the Reverend Timothy Edwards, and they grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And the print that you see here is a print of the original um, Princeton College. Now, um, young Aaron, believe it or not, passes the Princeton entrance exam when he is only 11 years old and he is refused entry due to his very young age. So even though he had personal connections, they were concerned that he was too young to be in the presence of older teenage boys. Um, Burr at that time continued studying. Now to give you an idea, Princeton and Yale were both what we would refer to as Presbyterian colleges, and they had very difficult entry requirements. The young men applied at about 15 years old and they needed to pass tests in English, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, Hebrew is unique to Princeton and Yale. The Anglican schools did not require that. They also must have a basic knowledge of geography, math, science, classical literature, and history. Um, so when you think of it, young Burr could do all of this at 11 years old. Incredibly impressive. Well, when he's refused entry, he continues studying. He develops a very rigorous plan of daily study for himself, very disciplined. And when he is 13, he's allowed entry to the sophomore class. He then graduates at 16 with full honors. Um, Burr is disciplined and intellectual throughout his life. I think those are the two greatest qualities that characterize him. And he will display these major personality traits and he will pass them on to his daughter. Burr is also very very Presbyterian in the way he deals with others in the outside world. If you are not a part of Aaron Burr's closest innermost circle, he does not reveal himself to you. And um, this is partially because Burr believed that if you didn't have something good to say, you should not say it publicly because it reflected poorly upon you. This is part of the reason that people today see Burr as elusive or hard to pin down or even sinister in some way. But it's my belief that that's simply his strict Presbyterian upbringing at work. Now, um, he, he graduates from, from Princeton and he studies divinity for a time and decides he doesn't like that. And he moves on to study law with his sister's husband, Tappan Reeve in Connecticut. And of course, like it did with everyone else his age, the Revolutionary War interfered with his plans. 
So Burr now becomes a Revolutionary War soldiers. Um, he was mustered into the army in 1775 as a captain, as many of the young college men were. And the first battle he'll participate in is the Battle of Quebec in December of 1775, where he has his first taste of warfare when he's standing next to New York commander, Major General Richard Montgomery, who is the first person killed in the battle. So Burr gets his first look at warfare. By the summer of 1775, in 76, um, Burr has moved on to New York City, where he's now under the command of General Israel Putnam. And you might know him for the famous saying, don't fire until you can see the whites of their eyes. Um, Israel Putnam's men were, you know, the American army at that time was unskilled and panicking, shooting virtually anything that moved, wasting ammunition. So it's General Putnam that tells them, don't fire until you can really see the rights of their eyes. So he, he participates in the Battle of New York, as some of you might know. He helps Washington escape the clutches of General William Howe in September of that year. The following year, he's promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and he begins commanding his own regiment, Malcolm's Additional Continental Regiment, of about 300 men. Um, by the Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey in 1778, he is commanding that unit. Unfortunately, during that battle, he suffered severe heat stroke, which then will, would plague him for the rest of his life. By 1779, he's assigned to protect an area that stretched from Kingsbridge, which would be the northern part of Manhattan, to about 15 miles north where Washington was headquartered. And um, I have a picture here of what Burr's headquarters looked like at that time in Westchester. In March of 1779, he was uh, forced to resign his military commission as a result of his continuing poor health as a result of that heat stroke. But while Colonel Burr was serving, he attended a salon in what today we call Hohokus, New Jersey at the home of Madame Theodosia Bartow Prevost. Um, she was the wife of Jean-Marc Prévost, a Swiss-born British officer in one of the Royal American regiments. He was off fighting the war and his wife was holding regular salons at her home, the Hermitage. She lived there with her mother, Mrs. Bartow, her half-sister, Mrs. Devisme, and her own five children. The ladies of this home were known as intelligent, gracious women. They often held salons for both American and British officers. And for you who aren't familiar, a salon would be a type of intellectual gathering where a lady would invite people to the salon. She would invite a guest speaker, maybe a writer or a musician, maybe a military officer, a scientist, someone of that nature who would then speak to the gathering. And they would have a a light meal and a question answer session. And she was uh, quite known for her salons. I believe it was thought that Madame Prevost held the finest salon in the New York, New Jersey area at that time. Um, Generals Washington, Green, Knox, and young Colonel Hamilton all attended her salons. Burr said when he walked in and he saw Mrs. Prevost, he was immediately spitten, smitten and in love and knew that he must be with her. She was a highly intelligent, well-educated woman. Later in life, he would write to her that since he was a boy, he imagined that there were women who were capable of the same high intellectual achievements as some men, but they had lost all hope of meeting one until he met her. He said, you fulfilled my childhood fantasy of one day meeting a woman of intellectual ability. And they were later bonded. After she died, he referred to her as my intellectual equal and moral superior, the finest woman and greatest lady I have ever known. So Burr falls instantly for a married lady, Madame Prévost. And uh, he continues visiting her regularly, stays often late into the night. And this is a picture of the Hermitage as it exists today. It is a museum and landmark in Hohokus, New Jersey. Um, both Aaron and Theodosia spoke fluent French. They loved discussing French philosophy, classics, and art. And the military, um, his fellow military soldiers um, later wrote a really um, 
amusing ballad about them called Aaron Burr's Wooing, which by the way, if you take my Hamilton and Burr tour, I, I recite on that tour, it's quite amusing. Now word hits uh, New Jersey that Major Prevost has died of yellow fever and now the door is open for Aaron and Theodosia to marry and they do in 1782. She is 10 years older than him. She has five young children and Burr adopts all of them as his own. He was a man of, of of so much love and big heart when it came to children and people in need. He provided an excellent education for both of her sons. The oldest, John Bartow Prevost, worked as a clerk in his law firm, later went on to become a successful lawyer himself and a Supreme Court judge in Louisiana. The second son, Frederick Prevost, became a successful landowner and farmer and owned, I think, all of what is known as Pelham, New York today. So both young men did very well. Burr also offered the job of tutoring the young men to a former fr a friend of his from the military who he knew needed a job. Um, but his friend turned him down as he didn't want to move to New York at that time. Now letters between Aaron and Theodosia during this time show an incredibly deep love and respect for each other, a real bonding of equals. Now, eventually they have their own child together, Theodosia Bartow Burr, born in 1783 on June 21st in Albany, New York, to great excitement. The whole family is so excited to welcome their newest little sister, Theodosia, to the family. In one of her letters, Mrs. Burr um, cites that, that Mr. Burr had accidentally that Mr. Burr had accidentally um, signed his personal correspondence about her birth using his professional signature and that she wrote letters of apology to all of the people who received that, that signature accidentally. So a little bit of excitement on Aaron's part with his firstborn child. Shortly after the family moved to New York City, by then the British um, occupation was over. Everyone was flooding back into New York. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton and their young son, um, Philip, arrived around the same time and Aaron Burr begins his legal and political career. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Burr together decide to educate their daughter as they would a firstborn son, meaning they are going to give her all of the same educational and social advantages of say a Philip Hamilton might receive, um, any firstborn son of that time. Um, in their view, this is a new nation, a new state with a new opportunity for girls, fresh, um, a fresh new start for everyone. And this, as you can imagine, is very controversial. Um, Theodosia proves herself though to be a brilliant child. And by the time she is three years old, she writes the first letter to her father who is off serving in the New York assembly in Albany. And this portrait you see here was done by Gilbert Stewart. You might know a very famous portraitist of the time. And it is Theodosia when she is uh, 11 or 12 years old. Now, Theodosia's early education is provided mainly by Mrs. Burr, who teaches her reading, math, penmanship, and French. And on the left is a letter that Theodosia wrote when she was about 13 years old. And you can see her excellent penmanship at that time that was considered a very important part of a person's character um, in the 18th and 19th century. Um, Burr provides guidance to her education through daily letters to both mother and daughter. Um, when she exceeds what would be considered that early education, um, New York City's finest tutors were hired to continue her education. And so at about the age of eight or nine years old, Theodosia began learning Latin, Greek, geography, the classics, and science. When Aaron writes a letter to his daughter asking her, how many lines of Homer did you read last week? Um, it was took me a minute to grasp the fact that he meant how many lines of Homer did you read last week in Greek? In Greek, I, it's stunning the level of education that young people received at that time, or I should say young people whose parents could afford such education at that time. Um, Burr really engages in letter writing as a means of teaching. When Theodosia confuses the words then and then in sentences, he writes to her that you're confusing them, but when you master Latin, this will help you in understanding their use better. 
Um, Aaron also tries to impart that same discipline that he felt made him so successful upon his daughter. And he writes to her, send me a weekly journal of everything you do every day. And he sends her a little sample journal of how it should be laid out. He tells her that you think you might think this is harsh, but the discipline will serve you well when you mature. Now, her mother makes sure, you know, she is still a little girl, that there's plenty of time for fun. And this includes trips to Fed Frederick's farm, horse riding, carriage riding, ice skating, and the kinds of things that little girls enjoy. I should also add that in addition to her intellectual studies, Theodosia is also expected to study music, dance, um, and, and all sorts of etiquette and, and the things that young ladies would be expected to know at that time. So she's taking on the um, burdens of what a girl should learn as well as what a young boy should learn. Um, at 10 years old, she translates the Declaration of Independence into French as a gift to her father. And Burr writes to Theodosia from um, Philadelphia. By now, he is a United States Senator. She's around 11 years old, so it's around 1990. Three, um, about her mastery of French. And he says he went out to look for a French book for her. And he says, I asked myself, what book shall I buy for her? She reads so much and so rapidly that it's not easy to find proper and amusing French books for her. And he tells her that he eventually did find something appropriate and he will deliver it when next he returns to New York. He also tells her that he has been sharing her letters with the great Philadelphia doctor, Benjamin Rush, and that Benjamin Rush cannot believe that she's a girl of but 11 years old, when surely she writes as if she is at least 16, and if not more mature. So you can see that Burr is very proud of the um, progress his daughter is making. Unfortunately, at home, it isn't going that well, because tutors often didn't show up because we can guess they probably weren't taking teaching a girl seriously. Um, Burr expresses his concern about this and he says, look, offer them twice the going rate because I don't want to switch tutors midstream, but if you have to find someone else. At this time, Theodosia is reading the, the Roman poet Horace, the Roman playwright Terence, and she's begun studying Edward Gibbons, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. All of this would be expected of a young man her age as a prerequisite to a college admission. So you can see that Burr is really building her education in anticipation of a college level education for her. Now her parents are inspired by a number of different people who advocated education for women. And, um, and one of those ladies is pictured here. This is Mary Wollstonecraft. And Mary Wollstonecraft, you might know, is the author Mary Shelley's mother. And she wrote a book. She, she wrote books in England about education. She wrote a book called A Vindication of the Rights of Woman in which she proposed that if girls were educated side by side with boys and taught to think critically rather than experience the world through their senses or sensibility, they would be better sisters, daughters, wives, mothers, and subjects of the crown. Very controversial book, and um, she, was, she was reviled in England for writing this. But Burr read the book while he was in Philadelphia. He sent a copy home to his wife to read, and this inspired them to continue their efforts to raise Theodosia as a thinking, reasoning, independent woman. In one of his letters to his wife, Burr commented on the frivolous society women of Philadelphia. And uh, this is a quote from the letter. He says, if I could foresee that Theo would become a mere fashionable woman with all the attendant frivolity and vacuity of mind adored with whatever grace and allurement I would earnestly pray God to take her forwith hence. In other words, I would rather my daughter die than become one of these frivolous society women eternally dependent upon a man's favor to live and survive. Even Burr's harshest critics later would praise his daughter as being the perfect combination of her father's searing intellect and mother's flawless social graces. She seems to have very successfully embodied both of those characteristics of her parents. Now, throughout this time, throughout the time that Theodosia and Aaron were married, uh, Mrs. Burr was sick 
Um, she was sickly from the time he married her and it later became apparent that she had stomach cancer. Um, Senator Burr wanted to resign his seat in the Senate to care for her, but she refused to allow him to do it. So at that time, daughter Theodosia took responsibility for her mother's medical care in addition to her studies. She's going to write to her father on behalf of her mother when her mother's too sick to do so. And she's also going to write details to her father of her mother's medical treatment in New York. Um, she also will be responsible for implementing treatment recommended by Dr. Rush of Philadelphia. So Theodosia, in addition to studying and learning, now becomes her mother's number one caretaker. Um, her older brothers do help out to some extent, but it seems that the most of the burden falls on young Theodosia at this time. Um, Burr still uses their communications as an educational opportunity. And in one letter he says, you know, can you explain the difference to me between a decoction and infusion? And he asks her, you know, what is laudanum? Where does it come from and what is it used for? So he's still educating her through this time. In 1794, when Theodosia was barely um, 11 years old, um, her mother died, um, leaving Aaron and his daughter alone now to continue life together. And Aaron um, will take up a role now as a single father. Now, soon after, Aaron um, leased an estate known as, as Richmond Hill, and that's in today's West Village. Um, actually, it's the entire West Village, all 256 acres of the West Village. It was managed by Burr's freed slaves, um, now educated servants, particularly a woman he writes to often named Peggy, um, who managed the household. Um, Burr paid for Peggy to attend a day school. Her letters are eloquent, eloquent and beautifully written. And she writes to Burr that there's no need to send the other servants to school, that she can teach them in her spare time. And she is the one who will partly teach Theodosia so that she's capable of becoming the mistress of the estate herself. And she'll begin taking on that role at 13 years old. For those of you who know where St. Paul's Chapel is, on the Fulton Street side of St. Paul's Chapel, that was known as Partition Street. That was the Burr town home while the Burr country home was in the West Village. And Theodosia split her time between those two households. Um, when she's 13 years old, Burr, um, Theodosia receives a letter, I'm sorry, when she's 14 years old, such a big age difference, but she's much more mature now. <laughs> Burr writes to Theodosia from Philadelphia about, about Iroquois chief Joseph Brandt, an old friend of his. The Iroquois took the side of the British during the Revolutionary War and had been banished from their ancestral homes to Canada. While a senator in Philadelphia, Senator Burr, tried to negotiate a return to those lands on the part of the Iroquois. As part of that, he wrote to Theodosia and asked her to hold a state dinner in New York for Chief Brandt and to invite everyone that would be important in helping him make the connections needed to perhaps bring the Iroquois relocation back to New York into effect. And by all accounts, the dinner was a phenomenal success. Theodosia wrote all of the um, invitations in her own hand. She selected the um, menu the place settings, she greeted everyone at the door, seated everyone, sat at the head of the table and conducted the dinner as if it was a state dinner. Um, Chief Brandt was, um, was just so impressed by this young woman. He, he could not believe how proper and capable she was. And he introduced her to visit his home at any time. And later when she marries, she will go to visit him on her honeymoon. So that's her great dinner for Chief Brandt at Richmond Hill when she's 14 years old. Now, Aaron Burr and Theodosia were also a big part of New York's French society. As a result of the French Revolution, um, there were many refugees in New York that formed their own French community. And uh, one of those ladies to arrive was a, um, a governess to the Palace of Versailles, Madame de Senat, who arrived with her daughter and Natalie de Lage de Valou. Um, Natalie was born at the uh, Palace at Versailles, excuse me, that's my cat, the Palace at Versailles. And um, her mother sent all of her children to different countries in the hope that some of them would survive and one day return to France. So Natalie arrived in New York when she was about 14, the same age as Theodosia. 
Burr offered space in his Partition Street townhouse for Madame de Senat to start her Senat Academy, which became a very popular French academy for the aristocratic families of New York. Theodosia attended. And um, Burr also adopted Natalie um, as a sister to Theodosia. And she lived um, until she was married with Theodosia. She was like a sister to her, a constant companion and friends for life. Natalie eventually married into the Sumter family of South Carolina. Now, the importance of her immersion in French society um, can't be overlooked. Remember, at that time, French was the international language of all diplomacy. So Theodosia now is being completely steeped in French music, French manners, art, literature, philosophy, everything. Um, Burr is planning for his daughter to become maybe an ambassador, a senator, or a diplomat, and wants her fully comfortable in everything French. And Natalie is her way into this society. And by all accounts, Theodosia mastered this quite well. Now, Burr is going to return to New York and to the New York Assembly in 1798. And it's time now for Theodosia at 15 to take her side at her father's, uh, to take her place at her father's side. Um, Burr is going to work with his usual political opponent, John Jay, to abolish slavery in 1799. This is something Burr tried when he was in the assembly in 1784, but failed. But knowing now that Governor Jay was also an abolitionist, both of them officers in the New York Manumission Society, he was able to get this through the assembly and Jay signed it. So finally, slavery was fully abolished in the state of New York, something very meaningful to Burr. Um, Theodosia began accompanying Burr on various trips. She'd already been to Philadelphia um, in the Senate chambers to hear the president speak. Um, and Burr now has become the leader of New York's Democratic Republicans and is traveling up and down the East Coast that year to whip support for the Democratic Republican presidential candidate, Thomas Jefferson. Burr, you can imagine at this point, is at the height of his political career. He has a national household name. Theodosia is at the height of her New York City popularity. Um, but there are detractors. Colonel Robert Troop, who was a friend of both Hamilton's and Burr's, um, said that you know there was no doubt as to Theodosia's mastery of what they would call masculine education. But he said, she knows nothing of the sewing needle. In other words, he's saying, where will she fit into society? Who, what men want a woman around when they're talking about serious things? And she'll have nothing to talk to the women about. And Robert Troop actually has a rather good point here. And um, some of the men in New York, one of them being the great writer Washington Irving and his older brother Peter, who I'll be speaking about in a few minutes, welcomed um, Theodosia into their society as some New York men were open to having an intelligent women around them, but it will be a rough life for Theodosia in the future. Um, Burr's advice about, ignore, about hostile remarks is that she should ignore them. He says, if you are at a dinner and someone makes a hostile remark to you, you are best off completely ignoring it and continuing the conversation where it was before the remark was made. He says, because you will be more remembered for your response than the initial insult that provoked it will be. Very good advice from a very savvy gentleman, Aaron Burr. And um, by all accounts, Theodosia did do that. I, I, I should add that there were ladies present at these social gatherings who were friends of her father's, who were advocates for Theodosia and would often um, interrupt some of these um, sessions of, of putting her down and speak on her behalf so that she would not have to. Of course, she's a teenage girl and she's going through the usual insecurities and depressions. She tells her father and her father says, do not be depressed. She, he says, you are extraordinary. You have exceeded all all of my wishes and you are my greatest love in this life. And so you see a caring father um, giving his daughter the support she needs to get through these difficult teen years. On the other hand, Theodosia and Natalie 
together are the highlight of New York City society. They speak English, they speak French, they speak Italian, they're always well-dressed, well-coiffed, very gracious young ladies. And Theodosia is often seen walking around New York on the arm of Mayor Edward Livingston, who I looked up and found that he was the deputy grand master of the lodge from 1801 to 1803. So I thought that was quite interesting connection to all of you. And uh, there were many um, rumors and, and uh, ideas that maybe um, she would be the next um, Mrs. Livingston in New York, but Theodosia had other ideas about looking for a husband. And that idea is Joseph Alston. Um, Joseph Austin is from South Carolina, from the area of Charleston today, and he was born in 1779. He's a bit older than Theodosia, and they meet while Theodosia is accompanying her father on a political trip through New England. Um, Joseph Austin is also traveling through New England at that time. Like Aaron, he is a graduate of Princeton College. He was a law student under the um, tutelage of Edward Rutledge, who was the youngest signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he passed the South Carolina Bar Exam in 1799. Um, Austin was a brilliant young man, but he really did not enjoy the practice of law. Instead, he gave it up in order to try to rehabilitate his family's failing rice plantation. And he turned out to be an excellent businessman. Eventually, he expanded the plantation to 6,287 acres and became one of the wealthiest aristocratic men of South Carolina. Eventually, he makes a proposal of marriage to Miss Burr. And after a bit of going back and forth, um, she accepts his proposal of marriage. People at the time made it very clear that Theodosia chose her own husband, that it was not her father, but it was her own choice to marry Joseph Alston. Um, there was quite a bit of disappointment throughout the New York salons when this news got out as there were very many young men in New York who were suitors for Miss Burr. Um, and uh, they said that many hearts were broken at the time, um, but uh, she made her choice and they were married February 2nd, 1801, um, just one month before Aaron Burr became the third vice president of the United States. And she attended his swearing in as Mrs. Joseph Alston. The following year in May, um, their son, Aaron Burr Austin, is born. And this is um, one of uh, the only surviving portraits of Joseph Austin here on this slide. Now, I'm going to veer off from Theodosia for a while to talk about the gubernatorial election of 1804 and duel with Alexander Hamilton, because although Theodosia is in South Carolina, she's a young mother and she's focusing on her life there, this, you can imagine, is going to have a huge impact on her life. So in 1804, um, Vice President Burr has fallen out of favor with President Jefferson, and he runs for governor of New York against Morgan Lewis. And well, when I looked up Morgan Lewis, I found um, that he will be a future Grand Lodge Master from 1830 to 1843. So I thought that was an interesting connection as well. And I, I, I should tell all of you that um, I became very interested in the role of Freemasonry during this time when I visited the library and saw the Irving family sword and saw that all of the Irvings were members of Lodge, Holland Lodges 8 or 9, except Washington Irving. And this really piqued my interest in the role of Freemasons during the rebuilding of New York after the Revolutionary War. And, and that's a new project I'm working on. But back to, back to this. Um, this was a politically charged, nasty election. And I remember telling my my customers in 2016 that if you think this presidential election is bad, you should have been around for the gubernatorial election of 1804. It was nasty beyond belief. Um, New York's newspapers were publishing all kinds of negative propaganda about Burr, about Hamilton, who wasn't even running for office, and anyone associated with either of these two men. Now, a bunch of Burr supporters, and they're colloquially, no, colloquially known as Burrites, went about and started a new newspaper. And you can see the masthead here. It was called The Corrector. And you can see that the publisher calls himself Toby Tickler Esquire. And it turns out that Toby Tickler Esquire are the brothers, Peter Irving and Washington Irving. And I also mentioned that Peter was a member of either Highland Lodge number eight or number nine for many, many years. 
And they go ahead and they publish this newspaper they call The Corrector, which primarily um, straightens out all of the propaganda in the other newspapers. So they say they're correcting the record by publishing their newspaper. And it's full of some great comedy and satire as well as both brothers were um, really good satirists, very funny guys. Um, but while all of this is going on, Hamilton made some very derogatory remarks about Aaron Burr at a dinner near Albany. And eventually Burr loses the election to Morgan Lewis who becomes our governor, but the remarks at the dinner do not go away. Um, Hamilton's remarks at that dinner were overheard by a man named Charles D. Cooper, um, who wrote it all down and sent it to a really scandalous newspaper in New York published by a man named James Cheatham. And Cheatham, of course, um, you know, published the whole contents of what he said. And uh, when people began asking Burr, you know, what do you think of what Cheatham published in his paper about you? Burr would simply say, well, you know, as a gentleman, I do not read James Cheatham's newspaper. So Mr. Cooper then wrote everything down and sent the remarks in a letter directly to Burr. This now puts Burr in an extremely difficult position because if word gets out that Cooper sent the remarks to Burr and Burr does nothing, people will see Burr as a coward. They'll say, oh, Burr is waving the white feather, right? He's a coward, he's showing the white feather. So Burr makes a brilliant lawyerly decision. He takes the letter and he sends it to Mr. Hamilton with a letter of his own. And he asks Mr. Hamilton as a gentleman to please confirm or deny the remarks Charles D. Cooper has sent him. Hamilton writes back an incredible four page letter to Burr in which he says, I don't know any Charles D. Cooper and I'm not really even sure what you mean in your letter because I'm not sure of your usage of this word here and this word over there. And it, it, it starts a mess. All Hamilton really had to do, Burr was giving him an easy way out. All he had to do was say, I do not know Charles D. Cooper, please disregard his comments and it would have been over. So now Burr writes back to Hamilton, Hamilton writes back to Burr and the two men writing back and forth to each other in the spring of 1804. Um, when Hamilton returned to New York, Burr sent his good friend, Peter Van Ness to see Hamilton. Hamilton, you know, pretty much threw Van Ness out of his house and said, you know, you know, I don't have anything more to say about this. Tell Burr to do as he must. And of course, as he must is challenge him to a duel, which is exactly what Burr did. So the duel took place on July 11th of 1804 in Weehawken, New Jersey. The only firsthand accounts we have of this duel are from the two seconds. Hamilton, of course, died. Burr never spoke of it. And the two seconds wrote their recollections. Now, keep in mind that both seconds, Hamilton second Nathaniel Pendleton and Burr second William Peter Van Ness are both skilled lawyers at this time, political operatives and astute politicians themselves. So they both have an interest in making their guy look good in their recollections of the duel. Now they do tell a virtually identical story of the duel except for the sequence of shots. So they agree on everything um, that Burr arrived first with Mr. Van Ness, they cleaned the dueling area, Hamilton arrived with Mr. Pendleton and a do and, and excuse me, a doctor, and um, they examined the guns, they chose their guns, they flipped a coin that showed that Hamilton would shoot first, they took their places, they counted and both men fired. And then the two stories change. Hamilton's second, um, um, Nathaniel Pendleton, I'm sorry, I always forget his name. Nathaniel Pendleton says that both men raised their guns and that Hamilton shot over Burr's head after Burr shot and hit him, causing him to pull the trigger on his gun. That Hamilton had no intention of shooting his gun. He was holding it aloft and when he was hit, he pulled the trigger. But Peter Van Ness says, no, that's not true at all. That Hamilton shot first over Burr's head, which was the custom in duels in New York at that time where the men shot above each other's heads or to the ground, to the side, and then both received satisfaction without anyone being hurt. Van Ness says, no, Hamilton shot over Burr's head as expected. Um, Burr waited four or five seconds for the smoke to clear and then he shot in the ground to the side of, of Hamilton. Guns being as, um, as uh, you know, 
inaccurate as they were, he accidentally shot Hamilton in the side. Uh, Mr. Van Ness says he knows this is true because when Hamilton was hit, Mr. Burr was stunned, dropped his weapon and immediately made his way to Hamilton's side. Um, Van Ness said then he then removed Mr. Burr from the dueling site at that time. I do not know which one of these men is telling the truth. They're the only two who were there who were eye had eyewitness accounts. So um, I don't know. Although I can say that studying Burr all of these years and reading other people who knew Burr, it is highly unlikely Burr would take this type of a political risk for himself and for his son-in-law, who now is moving up through the political hierarchy of South Carolina. So I think it's doubtful that Burr intended to shoot Hamilton, but that did not change the result of the duel that Hamilton died and Burr was forever scarred by that event. Um, Theodosia was shocked to find out about all of this. She did not find out until many weeks later when her father wrote to her and she wrote back to him quite upset. And she said, you know, why didn't you tell me you were having these difficulties with Mr. Hamilton as like my mother, I might have been able to steer you to calmer waters. And his response was, well, you're a young mother and I didn't want to trouble you. And her very terse response back is, no, you wanted me to find out you were dead after it happened. She was quite upset. She said, you spent all of these years teaching me to be someone you could confide in, someone to take my mother's place, yet you did not confide in me as you would have my mother. So she's very upset about the whole turn of events here. Burr's friends and confidants believed that had his wife still been alive, it's very likely the duel would have never happened, that um, his wife Theodosia was a brilliant um, political strategist and would have negotiated him out of the troubles with Alexander Hamilton. But, you know, again, that's just speculation as she did die and these events did take place. So now Theodosia herself goes on to live in South Carolina. And here is a young woman who grows up in New York society, accepted as an intelligent woman by the people around her, used to no slavery, growing up in an abolitionist family where the um, African servants in her home are all educated. They speak multiple languages, they use the library. And now she is the mistress of an estate with 200 slaves. Um, there were many things about life in South Carolina she did not like, the slavery aspect of the plantation, the weather, she spent summers in New York City with her son whenever possible, and the society where she said that after dinner, the gentleman retired to another room and she is left in a room of women who have no minds, no education, and just prattle on about useless subjects. So it turned out to not be the best life for her. Now. Um, after the treason trial, Burr was banished for, from America for three years. And um, in 1812, he finally returns um, after that absence and, and reestablishes his relationship um, with his daughter, his son-in-law and his grandson. But unfortunately, shortly after he returned, his grandson, Aaron Burr Austin, only 10 years old, died of malaria. Um, Joseph Austin later that year finally became the governor of South Carolina. Theodosia, though, never recovered from the loss of her son and remained what we would say today deeply clinically depressed over it. Um, that December, early January, Aaron and uh, Joseph decided that it might be good for Theodosia if she went to New York City, stayed with her father and saw her old friends. And at that time, he, um, he rented a schooner named the Patriot to bring her to New York and the ship was lost at sea. She was never seen again. Um, both men were fully devastated by her loss. She was everything to them. Aaron had now lost his wife and his daughter, his legacy. He was never the same. And I think it was Peter Irving who said that Burr would never again um, walk along the battery and look out at sea. He said the lights went off at Richmond Hill for all eternity um, when it became known that Theodosia was lost. Um, there are many rumors about what fate might have befallen her that I'm not going to get into here because they're all um, very hyperbolic and dramatic. Um, I'm just going to say that we don't know what happened to her. Her body was never found, neither was the ship. Um, Austin himself became very sick. He didn't take care of himself anymore. And he died only four years later. And um, Aaron lived until 1836, um, where he died in Staten Island after a stroke. And he is buried with the rest of his family at Princeton. So 
that is our full story of Theodosia Burr. And I hope, you know, very much that you have all enjoyed it. And I'm going to take